1. Kayla Unbihan Kayla Unbihan vanished from her Illinois hometown in an apparent abduction by her mother, who did not have custody. The nine-year-old's photo appeared on an episode of the Netflix show Unsolved Mysteries about parental abductions, an age progression image flashing on screen to depict what she would look like now. Months later, someone at a North Carolina store recognized Kayla as a missing child, setting off a chain of events that led to her mother's arrest and Kayla's reunification with her father in the Midwest. Here's everything we know about Kayla's abduction and safe recovery, and the questions that remain unanswered in the case. A child and mother vanished on July 4th. Kayla was born on July 5th, 2008, to Ryan Eskirka and Heather Unbihan in the western suburbs of Chicago. After the couple split, a judge awarded the child's father permanent custody. Kayla was spending July 4th with her mother in 2017, however, and was scheduled to be returned to her father the next day, on her ninth birthday. According to police interviews, Heather was last seen packing her belongings up to the roof of her car. Mr. Eskirka wrote in a GoFundMe established just days later. Her closest family members indicated she went on a camping trip to an unknown location in Wisconsin and was expected to return on Wednesday, July 5th at 7 p.m. for a parenting time exchange with me. Heather and Kayla did not show up for the court-ordered exchange, and the police were immediately contacted, and an investigation was launched. It was discovered that all of Heather's social media had been canceled and her phone turned off. As far as we know, no one has been able to reach her or has talked to her since the 4th of July. Because of this, the following day I had filed a missing persons report for both Kayla and Heather. Heather also did not show up for a court date motioned by her on Friday, June 7th. Her lawyer had not talked to her for days, was unaware of what happened, and was very concerned. Mother charged with abduction as father pleads for help. After Mr. Eskirka filed the missing persons reports, Ms. Umbihan was charged in 2017 with child abduction, a Class 4 felony, the Kane County State's attorney said Tuesday in a statement. A judge set her bail at $10,000 and, since then, South Elgin police pursued numerous leads and tips, working with police agencies from around the country in an attempt to locate the child and Umbihan. Mr. Skirka, meanwhile, was appealing for donations and information, writing on the GoFundMe that he planned to use the assistance to hire a private investigator and any additional cost concerning the search for them and their health and safety for when they are found. The safety and return of Kayla is the top priority of all of my family and I, and any help we receive through this funding is greatly appreciated, he wrote. Between July 2017 and May 2023, the page raised just over $2,500 toward its $10,000 goal, the last donation recorded on the site coming in nearly four years ago. In November, however, Kayla's picture featured on an episode of Netflix's Unsolved Mysteries. At the end of Abducted by a Parent, the final installment of the program's third Netflix season, missing posters and age progression images are shown from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NCMEC. For just under five seconds, a photo of Kayla at nine appears on screen alongside a picture of what she might look like as a teenager. A Bring Kayla Home Facebook page, meanwhile, was also promoting the age progression image, sharing it as recently as April 21st, created the same day as the GoFundMe, five days after Kayla was last seen in Wheaton with her mother. The page has more than 7,000 followers. Search meets unlikely ending. Kayla and her mother were at Westgate Regional Shopping Center on the evening of May 13th in Asheville, North Carolina, when they caught the notice of a person at upmarket consignment shop Plato's Closet, according to authorities. That person, recognized Unbihan, and recalled that the child was missing, Kane County State's Attorney's Office posted Tuesday on social media. A store employee immediately contacted Asheville Police, who contacted South Elgin Police. South Elgin Police confirmed the identity of the two individuals as Heather Unbihan and the missing child. Ms. Unbihan, 40, was subsequently taken into custody, and Kayla has since been reunited with her father. Mr. Eskirka, in a statement issued through the NCMEC, that he was overjoyed that Kayla is home safe. I want to thank the South Elgin Police Department, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and all of the law enforcement agencies who assisted with her case, Mr. Eskirka continued. I also want to thank all of the followers on the Bring Kayla Home Facebook page who helped keep her story alive and were instrumental in spreading awareness. We ask for privacy as we get to know each other again and navigate this new beginning. 
South Elgin Chief of Police Jerry Krauchik also thanked citizens across the country and other law enforcement agencies who worked so dedicatedly to help bring Kayla home. We are overjoyed to report that the child is in good condition and in good spirits since being reunited with her father, he said in a release. Law enforcement agencies and well-wishers were celebrating across several states as the case offered hope to investigators and families looking for people who've been missing for years. I certainly think this is a unique case, Asheville Police Lieutenant Jonathan Brown told WLOS. It is unusual. It's not a case that we see routinely or often. He marveled at how Kayla's mother had managed to go undetected for years. What's most unusual is the ability to stay off the grid, if you will, for that period of time, he said. Typically we leave a technological breadcrumb, and those are usually very easy and quick to be tracked down. This was not. What happens next? Following Ms. Unbihan's arrest in Buncombe County, she was charged with the felony offense of extradition, which she declined to waive. She posted $25,000 bond on May 16th and was released from custody, then turned herself in the following day in Kane County, Illinois, where she was booked on the abduction charge. The 40-year-old appeared before Judge Julia Yetter on May 18th and was released on bond with an electronic monitoring device. Kayla's father obtained an order of protection against Ms. Unbihan, who is barred from being within 1,000 feet of his residence and cannot leave Illinois without court permission, a Kane County State's Attorney's Office spokesman told The Independent. Ms. Unbihan's case has since been marked by a series of status hearings, including one on November 8th where she was ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. Her next status hearing is set for December 1st. She has yet to enter a plea on the abduction charge. The Class 4 felony in Illinois can carry a sentence of one to three years, often probationary. 2. Liz Carmichael In 1973, Liz Carmichael seemed to be the consummate Los Angeles businesswoman. She claimed to be a farmer's daughter, the widow of a NASA engineer and a graduate with a degree in mechanical engineering. She founded 20th Century Motor Car Corporation which designed a fuel-efficient low-priced car with only three wheels. She claimed the lack of a fourth wheel eliminated 300 pounds from the car's weight, allowing better gas mileage than four-wheeled cars. The nationwide aftershock of the 1973 oil crisis had shifted customer tastes to more fuel-efficient vehicles. The Dale, claiming 60 miles to the gallon, seemed the solution to the oil crunch. The car was said to cost less than $2,000. It was made of a special aerospace plastic and could withstand an impact against a brick wall at 50 miles per hour. It was also impossible to tip over. Carmichael told investors and the press that her company was renting three large aircraft hangars where they would soon start production. Investment money poured in, aided in part by a mention of the Dale by Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show. She was also interviewed by Newsweek and People magazine. One political cartoon showed Carmichael staring down well-heeled Detroit automobile magnates, which also gave the impression of women making their way in the workplace. The Dale, a sedan, was meant to be produced with the Ravel, a full-size, and the Vanagon, a family van, all three-wheeled. However, as it seemed too good to be true, the Dale was never meant to be made a reality. In 1974, investigators from the California legislature began to examine Carmichael and her company. She was originally accused of illegally selling both dealer franchises and cars that did not yet exist. The California DMV discovered that the company did not have a state permit to manufacture cars and that there was no evidence that these cars were even being manufactured. Investigator Bill Hall went to the lab where the cars were being designed. To him, it appeared that no actual work was being done. He also went to the aircraft hangars rented by Carmichael and found that they were empty. There were no tools, machinery, or equipment. It was also discovered that the company's rent had since expired on the hangars, meaning that they had no place to make the cars. Hall found that the Dale cars that were made had been constructed from shoddy materials. The vehicles had many problems, including no engine, two by fours holding up the rear wheel, an unattached accelerator, windows that could bend back and forth, and doors attached by regular house door hinges. Of the three Dales in existence, only one was able to run on its own power. No Van Agens or Ravels were ever reputed to have been produced. With the authorities closing in, Carmichael moved her business to Dallas. Two weeks later, however, the DA filed criminal charges against her for grand theft. Armed with a search warrant, 
Dallas police arrived at her home. She and her five children had since vanished. While looking through her home, investigators found evidence that Carmichael may have been hiding her true identity, particularly finding prosthetics. Nine weeks later, she was discovered living in Miami with her five children. A neighbor recognized her from a news photo and called the police. Carmichael was working for a dating service and calling herself Susan Rains. Investigators soon discovered another identity for Carmichael, Jerry Dean Michael. Carmichael claimed that she had begun taking hormone treatments in preparation for a sex change operation. As Jerry Michael, she was wanted for bilking people out of hundreds of thousands of dollars, as well as having an outstanding warrant issued against her by the federal government for counterfeiting. On April 12, 1975, Carmichael was arrested, extradited to Los Angeles, and put on trial. During the entire trial, she maintained that the Dale was a real car and could still be released. When asked why such little progress had been made, Carmichael countered with the inability to do so due to the failure of the California legislature to grant a license to manufacture. On January 24, 1977, she was convicted of conspiracy, grand theft, fraud, and counterfeiting. She was released on $50,000 bail which was paid by a TV company that wanted the rights to her story. For four years, she appealed her conviction. Finally, in 1980, she failed to show up in court for sentencing. She and her five children have not been seen in almost a decade. Thanks to a viewer tip, Carmichael was finally arrested on April 19, 1989, two weeks after the broadcast. At the time, she was living with one of her children in Dale, Texas, near Austin. She was working as a flower vendor going by the name Catherine Elizabeth Johnson. Interestingly, the town she was located in has the same name of the car that she planned to make. On April 26, Carmichael was returned to California where the judge gave her a 1-10 to 10 year sentence. She served two years in prison for her Los Angeles convictions. Carmichael died of cancer in 2004. A prototype of the Dale is in the permanent collection of the Peterson Automobile Museum in Los Angeles, California. A documentary series about Carmichael and the Dale, The Lady and the Dale was released by HBO in January 2021. 3. Bonnie Hine As a young boy, Aaron Hyam made statements about his mother within 48 hours of her seemingly vanishing from his life. Daddy heard her. He is said to have told a child protective services worker. As time passed, the boy's memory of the statement, as well as the multiple statements suggesting something violent happened to his mother, left his brain. His last name changed as did his relationship with much of the Jacksonville family that he was born into after Jeannie and Ronnie Fraser adopted him. When Aaron Fraser got married about 10 years ago, there was an unspoken understanding between him and his wife that they were not to talk about the past, a time when then three-year-old Aaron may or may not have seen his father kill his mother in their North Jacksonville home. Fraser explained this to attorneys in a 2016 deposition in preparation for his birth father's upcoming murder trial. He told the attorneys defending his father that December 14, 2014, changed all that. What happened on this day, he could not bottle up. He desperately needed to talk with his wife, or the investigator who had been searching for his birth mother in 1993. At the time, Fraser was working at his boyhood home a place he was removed from when he was just four after his father Michael Hyam became the prime suspect in his mother's disappearance. On January 7, 1993, police were called to a red roof and near the airport when a hotel worker discovered a purse with 23-year-old Bonnie Hyam's credit cards, ID, and hundreds of dollars in cash stashed in a trash receptacle. Later that night, her champagne-colored Toyota Camry was found in a long-term airport parking lot. Michael Hyam told police his wife of five years, left the home the night before after an argument about their marriage. Many who knew Bonnie Hyam well didn't buy the story, saying she loved her son far too much to just walk away. Police told her family they didn't have enough to arrest her husband, their only suspect in her disappearance. Many years later, Aaron Fraser and the woman who adopted him filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Michael Hyam. They won the deed to Hyam's North Jacksonville home in a multi-million dollar judgment. The home on Dolphin Avenue had been a rental for years, but now it was time to be done with it. On the weekend of December 14, 2014, Fraser rented an excavator, and he and his brother-in-law started to demolish the home's swimming pool. When the excavator rolled over a slab of concrete at a nearby outdoor shower, spider-web-like cracks spread through the slab. 
Fraser used a sledgehammer to break up the concrete. In the process, a water pipe broke, adding one more thing to his list of things that needed to be repaired. Fraser and his brother-in-law fumbled around in the dirt looking for the pipe when they found a plastic bag or possibly a thick plastic sheeting material. Fraser clawed at it with a shovel, breaking it open. Reaching inside, he pulled out what he thought was a coconut. He and his brother-in-law examined it, wondering why in the world a coconut would be in a bag. They then noticed the teeth and eye sockets. Fraser grabbed the phone. It was a church day. His wife did not pick up. Neither did the investigator from so many years ago. Fraser's brother-in-law called the police. Soon Fraser's boyhood home would be swarming with police and journalists as news got out that a partial skull had just been unearthed at the home where Bonnie Hyam had been reported missing. In a Duval County courtroom this week, Fraser, 29, will testify about finding what prosecutors say is his mother's skull, sealed away in a shallow grave under the home's outdoor shower. He will testify about what he remembers 26 years ago about his mother's disappearance. Facing him in court will be his birth father, 52-year-old Michael Hyam, eventually charged with murder four years ago in Waynesville, North Carolina. He was allowed to post bail and has been living in North Carolina. Jury selection begins Monday, and the trial is expected to last through the week. The medical examiner's results came back as homicidal death by unknown means. Police say they found a spent .22 caliber shell casing in the grave. Hyam owned a .22 caliber Marlin Model 60 rifle that had been taken into evidence in 1993 and was later released back to him, according to court records. Charging documents say Bonnie Hyam had been planning to leave her husband. In her preparation for the move, she opened a Barnett bank account, but her husband discovered it and forced her to close it several months before her disappearance. From that point, Bonnie Hyam began giving a friend money to keep for her. By early January 1993, $1,250 had been tucked aside. In the days just before her disappearance, she inquired about two apartments in Orange Park and had placed deposits on them. She planned to move on January 23, 1993, when her husband was away on a business trip. Investigators say that on January 6, 1993, Bonnie Hyam called a relative and said she was canceling her plans to come over that evening because she and her husband were discussing their marriage. In summary, Suspect Michael Hyam was the last known individual to have contact with the victim, according to his arrest warrant. A Facebook page with the name Bonnie Pesciuto, Hyam updates people on the progress of the case. In March, her sister, Liz Mahoney Peak, posted the following, Next month is going to hurt. It is going to rip off bandages and expose us to things we had long ago pushed to the back of our memories. But sometimes we have to rip off bandages to really begin to heal, Liz. 4. Mia Zapata Shortly after midnight on July 7, 1993, a woman left the Comet Tavern in Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood following a night out with friends. Around 3.30 a.m., some two miles away in the city's central district, a local sex worker discovered the woman's lifeless body. Investigators determined the victim had been beaten, raped, and strangled to death. When the woman was identified a few days later as 27-year-old Mia Zapata, this senseless crime made headlines all over the country. Zapata had fronted the Gits, a band that could have been the next big thing to emerge from the Pacific Northwest's red-hot music scene. At the time of Zapata's death, the Gits were on the verge of releasing their second full-length album and undertaking a European tour. A budding career is strangled, lamented the Seattle Times in a headline that was clever, but perhaps a bit tone-deaf. The New York Times News Service reported, her lyrics passionate, her voice powerful, Mia Zapata wrote and sang for a punk rock band that was attracting a national following for the music's raw honesty and emotion. In death, Zapata attained a level of recognition robbed from her in life. I first learned of her as a teenager swept up in the indie world of the mid-1990s, when you would see ads in Spin for Viva Zapata, the second album from Seattle's Seven Year Bitch, or the Zapata-inspired Epic Records benefit compilation Home Alive, The Art of Self-Defense, Featuring artists like Joan Jett, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Jim Carroll, Jello Biafra, Exine Cervenka, and Lydia Lunch. A decade would pass before authorities arrested, based on DNA evidence, Zapata's killer, who was sentenced in 2004 to more than 30 years in prison. He died in 2021. Her story has endured as fodder for the true crime industrial complex, 
revisited every so often on lurid podcasts or shows like Forensic Files. Now, more than 30 years after her death, one of Zapata's friends and former bandmates is reclaiming her narrative. Much to the distaste of those who knew and loved Mia, the true crime documentary and dramatization industry has seized on the circumstances of Mia's passing as a salacious story, Gitz drummer Steve Moriarty writes in the prologue of his new book, Mia Zapata and the Gitz, a story of art, rock, and revolution, out now from indie publisher Feral House. If one does an internet search today for the Gitz or Mia Zapata, information about her murder, the investigation to find the murderer, and the conviction of him ten years later predominate the results. The music, the lyrics, the people involved in creating the music are secondary or absent altogether. This cannot stand. Moriarty, now a psychotherapist in the Bay Area, began working on the book about a decade ago. After being approached to collaborate with a cartoonist who wanted to create a graphic novel about the Gits, that project never materialized, but it inspired Moriarty to write a memoir. I just realized that I had too much to say, he tells me recently. I went through the gamut of emotions around doing it. It was cathartic. It really was. I mean, I'm a therapist. I work with people that have been traumatized, victims of crime. So I understand how stuff must be processed. It must be brought to the surface. Mia Zapata and the Gitz discusses Zapata's murder only briefly in the prologue and epilogue, which describes the moment when Moriarty learned from a journalist that police had finally identified his friend's killer. Early on, Moriarty and other members of Seattle's music community hired a private investigator, and they participated in media interviews over the years to keep the pressure on. His narrative draws to a close on July 4, 1993, days before the Gits were scheduled to fly to New York on the cusp of a major record deal, their future looking bright. That's where the story ended for me, Moriarty says. The story began in 1985, when Moriarty and Zapata met freshman year at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. They formed the Gits after seeing a life-changing Dead Kennedy show on campus and relocated a few years later to Seattle, just in time for the punk-infused sonic insurgency that would turn the music industry on its head. They toured up and down the western half of North America, Moriarty writes, sharing the stage with legends in the making like Nirvana, Bikini Kill, Hole, Tad, Soundgarden, and Beck. You're a great fucking singer, Kurt Cobain told Zapata backstage one night. I asked Moriarty what he most wanted people to know about Zapata. Her unique creativity, he says. In the book, he cites her emotional intelligence, wit, and blues-inspired lyrics. She wasn't like what they probably think of as a quote-unquote punk singer, he continues. I would hope that they would listen to the band, listen to the music. That would be the easiest way for them to access what Mia was about. Her songs are just very heartfelt, truthful songs. By 1993, things were really starting to happen for the Gits. It was unbelievable, Moriarty writes, to think that after such a long uphill struggle for validation we were being mentioned in mainstream music magazines like Spin, Rolling Stone, Billboard, and The Village Voice. That June, following a Los Angeles show with Riot Girl Pioneers Bratmobile at the influential underground rock venue Jabberjaw, an Atlantic Records A&R rep took the band out to lunch on Sunset Boulevard a meeting that prompted the Gits to sign with the powerhouse entertainment lawyer Rosemary Carroll. We were being courted by the most artist-friendly, progressive, and innovative record company in the country, Moriarty writes. We would have the same legal team as Nirvana, Hole, Patti Smith, Lou Reed, Jim Carroll, Television, Bonnie Raitt, Steve Earle, and Willie Nelson. My God, how did we end up there? Fate had other, horrifically tragic plans for the Gits. In a different world, Zapata and her bandmates would have signed to Atlantic and embarked on that next phase of their promising careers. Like so many other bands of the era, they might have transcended the underground scene they were a part of, possibly breaking through on commercial radio and MTV. I wanted to know how Moriarty would rewrite their story if he could. I saw X play a couple years ago at a show in San Francisco, he tells me referring to the first-wave L.A. punk trailblazers who released their final album this month after 47 years as a band. I danced my head off and afterwards, I went and hung out with Xene and John Doe and talked to them for a while. I remember leaving that gig just feeling totally high, and I thought, man, that could be us. 5. Craig Williamson 
Craig Williamson was 46 when he married 41-year-old Christine Reinhardt at Lake Tahoe on October 7, 1990. They had known each other for only a month, but they knew from the start that they loved each other. They hoped to get into the lucrative business of fish farming. They bought a farm in Christine's home state of Wisconsin. They soon began raising tilapia, planning to sell it across the country. On August 28, 1993, he went out on a trip to Colorado Springs to sell fish. Christine was worried about him driving because he had suffered a concussion a few weeks earlier. After arriving there, he rented a car for business appointments. At 9 p.m. on August 30th, he spoke to Christine on the phone while at a hotel. This was the last time she heard from him. Craig was supposed to return home the next day, but he never arrived. That day, his credit cards were discovered in El Paso, Texas, 675 miles south of Colorado Springs. Two weeks later, and just across the border in Juarez, Mexico, his rental car was found abandoned. There were no signs of foul play. Detective Robert Johnson headed the Colorado investigation. Christine began her own investigation into Craig's disappearance. On September 14th, she arrived in Colorado Springs and visited the hotel that he stayed at. She learned that he had left his baggage and possessions behind. There was no evidence of a struggle. She believed that he may have been attacked the day he vanished. She believes that, due to his injuries, he wandered off to an unknown location. Television stations in Colorado and Wisconsin reported about Craig's disappearance and Christine's search. Within days, a retired nurse from Montana named Judy Inman came forward. Two weeks after Craig vanished, she was traveling from Montana to Washington on a train when she saw a disheveled-looking man on board. She believed he was Craig and remembered that he was talking about fish tanks. He also said that the fish was from outside of the United States. Being a nurse, she was certain that he had a head injury. Christine believes that the man was Craig, especially because of his ramblings about fish from out of state. She also believes he was headed to Washington because they had initially met there. She traveled there and continued her search. For six weeks, she went to various locations along the train route that Judy and the man were on. On December 26, 1993, Christine met with Judy and showed her photographs of each of the train stations along the route. Judy believed that the man resembling Craig had gotten off at Wishram, Washington, near the Oregon border. Christine believes that Craig might have mistaken Wishram from Washougal, a town that he had lived in during the 1980s. His son went there and placed missing persons posters. However, no trace of him was found. Christine believes that Craig is still alive and that he will be found one day. Christine believes that Craig was attacked by unknown assailants who stole his rental car and credit cards. Investigators believe that he was murdered and his killers abandoned his cards and car. Investigators have also suspected that Craig may have staged his disappearance based on how his credit cards were left in plain sight. They also noted that his rental car had his beard clippings in it. Lab technicians determined that they had been cut with scissors, suggesting that he was changing his appearance. He had $2,500 cash with him when he vanished. He and Christine also had put all of their money in the farm and borrowed another $400,000. Finally, his bus seemed ill-equipped to bring fish back from Colorado. It had no tanks, fish food, or coolers. In July 1995, Craig saw a re-airing of the broadcast and recognized himself. He was living in Key West, Florida. He claimed that he was mugged in Colorado Springs and developed amnesia, which was worsened due to the concussion that he suffered the month before he disappeared. He could not remember much else from the attack, claiming that he woke up in a hospital with the name Ron. He also claimed that he wandered aimlessly throughout the United States before arriving in Key West, where he found a job as a diver. Craig soon contacted Christine, along with his ex-wife. Unfortunately, he did not remember Christine or his family. Nevertheless, he and Christine were reunited a few days later. The later traveled to Colorado Springs, hoping that something would jog his memory. However, the trip was unsuccessful. They decided to divorce, but remain friends. Craig moved to California to stay with friends, while Christine moved to Wyoming to start life anew. Despite Craig's claims, Investigators are still suspicious of his amnesia and believe that he staged his disappearance. They believe that he ran away to escape debts and the responsibilities of running his new business.